Hello, BookTube. It's Tuesday, and that means Tag Tuesday. I have not been tagged in anything because BookTube hates me, because I smell. I'm a lepa, a pariah. Uh, but that doesn't stop me from making a tag of my own. I made an original tag of my own for today that I'm hoping you will all do, and that is connected with a BookTube event that you all love that is just on the horizon, just a week away. June on the Range, a BookTube event created by Michael K. Vaughn last year. I was one of the co-hosts last year. I'm one of the co-hosts again this year. Uh, is coming in June, and it is designed to celebrate Western novels, which once upon a time ruled the roost, as far as uh, the literary world goes. They don't anymore. I don't think it's possible for you to make a living as a Western author right now, unless maybe some people might do it in the self-publishing world. But the, the general uh, reader readership in bookstores has no taste for them anymore. It seems to have gone right out of the market. Once upon a time, that wasn't true. And there have been millions of these things. And in June, you're supposed to just exalt yourself in this genre. It's a, it's a, a huge amount of fun. And I decided to do a tag, to make my own tag. I haven't made an original tag in a while. Uh, connected with June on the Range. This is the Rootin' Tootin' June on the Range tag. And you'll notice right away <laughs> that the a lot of the questions are the nosy kind that I like myself. I'm very nosy as a, as a person. Uh, but they're a lot of fun, too, I hope. Uh, so here, here we go. We've got a, a list of questions, starting with uh, number one, a ways out west. Uh, and this is a very simple question. Have you ever been to the American West? And for the purposes of this tag, we can describe that as north of the Rio Grande, uh, east of the Rocky Mountains, south of the Canadian border, and technically I would want to say west of the Missouri River. But if not the west of the Missouri River, then certainly west of the Mississippi. So that, those are your parameters. Have you ever been there in that area of the country? And I have, of course. I have I've tramped over every single inch of that area of the country. Been stung by almost every single rattlesnake in that area of the country. Uh, and spent a lot of time there. Spent a lot of time in a lot of that area, including on the, the, Wind, Res the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. I ended up spending a lot more time than a lot longer a stay than I thought I would spend. It's a it's mostly Arapaho and Shoshone, uh, and I got to know a lot of people there. I got to make some really good friends. Also had some friends in Montana, uh, on on you know on really open land. It's it's a weird landscape experience if you've never had it. Uh, and I'm curious to know if you have. Have you ever been? in the American West, the very setting of all of the, the Western novels that we'll be reading in June on the Range. Uh, and question number two is Dry Gulch. What's the smallest town that you've ever visited? And also, because I'm nosy, how small is your town right now? Uh, and I don't know off the top of my head what the smallest town I've ever visited has been. I've been to places that had just a few inhabitants. But I don't know if they would actually be incorporated as a town. Although I could swear that in the American West, one of them had a sign, an actual road sign, that said, like, Population 6 or something like that. It was never anything, it was never any big deal. It always seemed to me to be sort of a gimmick. Although I have spent time in Iowa towns that have only a few hundred people. Uh, I, so I guess that would be the smallest that I, that I actually know is incorporated as a town. And as for my own town, well, I live in Boston. And the population of Boston is around 650,000 uh, at night. <laughs> it's around 650,000 people who live in the greater Boston area, all the sprawling neighborhoods that constitute the greater Boston area. But during the workday, that population doubles. It, it swells to, you know, uh, 1.5 million, something like that, as people commute from all over. In the airports, on the trains, on the roads, they commute from all over to work in Boston during the day. So it, it, goes, it goes wildly up and down. But 650,000. Uh, then question number three is where the buffalo roam? And uh, there's a barrage of questions here. Have you ever seen an American buffalo in person? Would be, you know, the big question here. But I also added, uh, what's the largest hoofed animal that you've ever seen? And also, uh, right now, where you live, are you under the impression that you live near coyotes? Uh, and taking these questions in order, I have seen American buffalo in the wild, but it doesn't really count. We talk a lot about how uh, in the 19th century, just mindless deprivation drove the, the American buffalo to the edge of extinction, but really not. Really, they did. 
really the species did go extinct as a wild species that has not been thoroughly reconstituted by human beings virtually extinct i've seen of course the the buffalo that are in yellowstone here in the united states uh but as far as the largest hoofed animal that i've ever seen goes that would probably have to go to a hippopotamus there are some species of hippos that get very very big and i've seen them up close and personal uh and as for coyotes Yes, I am under the impression that I have coyotes near me, <laughs> right just a mile away in a big tract of land called the Arboretum, the Arnold Arboretum. There is at least one mated pair of coyotes that live there, and I know this because I have heard them, and more than heard them, I have seen them, and more than seen them, I have met them, and more than met them, I have face smooched with them. <laughs> Not the cubs. If there are cubs, I haven't met them, but I've met the male and female. Uh, but I'm curious to know about you. It's always thrilling. Every once in a while here, you will hear them just setting up a cry over there in the woods and the wooded hills of the Arboretum. For all the world, as if you were hearing them from a tent while camping out west, which I, I have heard that innumerable times. But then it's dozens, all crying at the sky, all crying to each other, or crying at the moon, as the, the stereotype goes. Here, it's just a couple. So it's, it feels like a very thin sound, very lively, but very thin. And it's always weird when you're hearing, you know, innumerable sirens go by or you're hearing the train pulling into the station or whatnot. And in the background of that, late at night, after one in the, at night, you're hearing that as well, that primordial sound. That's always amazing. Uh, but I want to know about you and the you folks in the UK, foxes don't count. <laughs> in this case, I want coyotes. Uh, then, uh, question number four is old Doc Fry, <laughs> and that is, what's your history with Westerns? Novels, TV, movies, uh, and for me, although I was perfectly aware that of the adventures of the Lone Ranger on TV, there was a 30-minute black and white TV show, then it went to color, of the adventures of the Lone Ranger, I was perfectly aware of that show, and I know, I've probably seen every episode, uh, but I was impatient with it because it was on at the same time as the adventures of Superman and the Lone Ranger is not bulletproof. <laughs> he can't fly. He needs a horse to get around. So of course I was a little impatient with it, but I would say that my, when it comes to literature, I mean, after that, you know, after there was the Lone Ranger on TV and then I watched a lot of Western movies, all the classic Western movies that I went, that I went and saw and that I dearly, dearly loved. You will scarcely, on BookTube, unless you talk to David Murphy, you will scarcely find a John Wayne fan bigger than I am. Uh, but I would say, when it comes to literature, and here we're stretching that term quite a bit, when it comes to literature, I think my, my real systematic introduction to Westerns was Marvel Comics, Western comic books. Kid Colt, Two-Gun Kid, especially Rawhide Kid, uh, that is probably my main introduction to Westerns, to the whole idea of them. Uh, and then I moved on from there to books. Louis L'Amour especially, of course, there's so much Louis L'Amour, and it was so readily available. My father did not have the stereotypical wall of Louis L'Amour novels. He had no patience with them whatsoever. I overheard him once say, you know, in, in terms that I can't repeat to a family audience, how dumb he thought they were. I guess I originally imbibed that idea and for a while was probably snobbish toward them, but I've been revisiting them steadily over the years, and they aren't dumb. Most of them aren't dumb. Most of them aren't well put together. But the ones that are well put together are quite good. Uh, so it, I moved on from Louis L'Amour, and of course, June on the Range last year was an eye-opening experience for me, because it introduced me to a whole bunch of Western writers that I didn't know existed. I had no idea what they were like, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, then, uh, question number five, uh, Diamond Lil at the Rialto Saloon. <laughs> And then again, this is just a nosy question. Feel free to not do this tag if you don't want to. Uh, and that is uh, addressing another key element of a lot of Westerns. It flies under the radar, but it's in almost all of them. That's alcohol. I want to know in this question, not only what is your relationship with alcohol and what has it been, but also have you ever been friends with a bartender or been a bartender yourself? Uh, and my own relationship with alcohol right now is just the way it should be. I am thor it is thoroughly domesticated. I will, I will be happy to have to indulge in a rain barrel full of cheap red wine if I've got a guest. But I now have no taste, no interest, wouldn't dream of drinking, or much less drinking to excess, on my own. 
And I have never seen the appeal of going to a bar. <laughs> never. I've done it from time to time when, socio when sociability required it. But I've never seen the appeal at all of doing that. But for a long time there, for 10 years, I did drink alone. Just in my room. Uh, and that's... I, that that increasingly it took a while, but it increasingly bothered me. So I a long, long time ago, I just simply stopped doing that. Uh, and now I, it is there's there is a couple of bottle of wine of bottles of wine on the top of the refrigerator because you don't want to not have wine if you have a guest suddenly. But usually now when I have a guest, I go there's a wine shop down the street. I just go there and buy a bunch of stuff to prepare for it. But otherwise, thought never crosses my mind. Mainly, I think. Be, the, the, me desisting from that, that solo drinking in a room largely coincided with the return with my return to the reviewing world, to the writing world. Because you absolutely cannot do... Well, you can. You can do regular and extremely prolific deadline work while drinking, but it's an uphill battle. You're putting huge obstacles in your own path. It's... it's I probably not a coincidence that right when that started to become my life again, that element just disappeared. Uh, but I'm curious to know about you. Feel free. Uh, then we have question number six, the city slicker from back East. <laughs> what do you consider the best Western novel you've ever read? None of this is a stereotypical answer for me, but I'm going to say Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. I've read now lots and lots of Western novels, but I've never read anything that comes close to that. I don't know for sure whether or not he set out to write the greatest Western of them all, but I think he certainly did. And I'd be, I'd be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't think that when they read Lonesome Dove. It looks intimidating because it's so big, but it's fantastic. You, if you're intimidated by it, if you were putting it off because it's such an investment of time, you really ought to take it down and try it. It's one of those big books. There are, there are some big books that they snare you slowly. They grow on you like mold. Uh, Lonesome Dove is not one of those books. It will grab you right away. Uh, so I'm going to say Lonesome Dove for this. Uh, then number seven is Man with a Badge. And this is, uh, have you ever been in charge of other people? What's the most authority you've ever handled? And do you think you'd be any good at it? Or do you think you were any good at it? And when you're estimating good at it, if you've had authority over other people, you want to span the spectrum one end of good would be that you get Christmas cards from people without making that office policy. And the other, the opposite end of good would be that you've got people killed. <laughs> so somewhere in between there. And I, uh, if we're talking humans here, I, I have complete authority over millions and millions and millions, and maybe billions of people on this planet, but they aren't human. <laughs> so, uh, so we're talking human here. If you, if you're talking human, I have never really been all that comfortable wielding authority it's always struck me that i've known people who do it better and my goal in authority structures has almost always been to find the people who wield it well and help them to do it i can be a help to such a person uh but not to do it myself occasionally it has been necessary because occasionally in addition to being a sexy influencer on youtube and also a prolific book reviewer i've also been a book section editor or the managing editor of a literary magazine. Sometimes that has happened. Uh, and when that happens, you are. In a, if, if you're a managing editor, maybe not so much. There might be newer editors lower on the masthead that, you know, if in some wild instance one of them were to get out of line, it might be your job to tell them, you know, don't do that again. Uh, but when you're a book section editor, there is authority there. You've got freelancers who you're, you know what you want and you know what you don't want. So if you give a freelancer a book and you say, I'd like 800 words by the 13th of the month, uh, and they aren't ready on the 13th of the month, well, then if you're, if you're a good book section editor, you'll have all sorts of backup material. Never, never depend on a freelancer. If you're a good book section editor, you will have backup material so that if they miss their deadline, you don't, you can, you don't need to wait on that piece. Uh, and also... You know, if they make the deadline and they hand you 1,300 words, you're, if you're the book section editor, you, the authority is you. You're not going to go running to your editor-in-chief. You're going to say to that reviewer, this won't do, cut it in half, or I can't use it. Uh, that's not really the same thing as the kind of authority that I'm kind of thinking of in this question. But it, it has largely happened. But the actual kind of authority of just telling people what to do 
giving them specific orders or busy work or whatnot. I've sedulously avoided that in my life. I was in retail for 25 years and was never anything other than a book clerk. Never wanted to be any kind of a manager. Never wanted to have to check to see, you know, to, to issue the kind of, of horrifying retail bromides that come out of the lips of kids as soon as they get to be an assistant associate manager. They're normal people until you give them even a tiny amount of power. And then they're looking at people who are 60 years old and saying, if you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. Or walking over to two adults who are talking to each other and saying, cut the chit chat. I actually had a manager do that to me once at Old Wordsworth in Harvard Square, and I, I, I it, it totally stunned me. There were no customers. I was talking with a coworker of mine. We we were both stationed at the register. We couldn't move. I was talking with a coworker of mine. This girl came up and said, "Cut the chit chat." And I said, "Who the hell do you think you're talking to?" <laughs> and it went all the way up the line to the owner of the store, who said, "You know, don't go around telling people to cut the chit chat." <laughs> but that's the kind of authority that I'm really talking about. Not. The kind of authority that I have now, I am a book section editor now, but it, it's not really the same thing at all. It's a small book section, <laughs> let's just say that. I'm not the editor, an editor at the Wall Street Journal. It's a small book section, and I am, I think, a pretty prepared book section editor. I've had this job before. So I'm not going to any freelancer uh, for a make-or-break proposition. I'm not going to any freelancer where if they don't do what they promise, I'm up a creek. Instead, I'm ready. I've got all sorts of backup plans so that I'm ready. Uh, so that doesn't really count. I'm mainly talking about actual authority. And if we're talking about that kind of actual tell people what to do authority, I've never had it. Not with humans. Uh, and I'm curious to know if you have and what you make of it and how it felt. Do you think you're a natural at that? Do other people think you're a natural at that? I'd love to hear it. Uh, then, uh, question number eight, prompt number eight is the tombstone kid. And this is, have you ever fired a gun? Are you perhaps a gun aficionado? And if you live in America, have you ever been shot? <laughs> Naturally, I want to know that because much like alcohol or much like alcohol or buffaloes or whatnot, this is part of the Western genre. So, uh, I naturally want to know your relationship with this element of the Western genre. I myself have fired, I've pulled the trigger of a gun once at a firing range uh, because friends of mine told me, you have to experience this. You read about it all the time. You have to experience it at least once. And they thought I would go through a whole clip, you know, firing at a target down the firing range. I pulled the trigger once and that was more than enough for me. More than enough. It horrified me. Absolutely horrified me. That a human being could have that kind of power with no effort. You just pull it, you squeeze on the trigger, and that's it. And the end of the world comes out of the weapon that you're holding. No, I didn't. I, it horrified me. So I've never done that. And amazingly, despite all the places that I have been, and all the travels that I've had, and all the adventures that I've had, I've never been shot. So I'm curious to know. I, I, I'm certainly not a gun aficionado. Uh, to put it mildly, I am not a gun aficionado. I, I, and the, the current debate roiling in America, in the alt-right circles, about... America, for those of you who don't live here, the one thing you probably know about the country is it is absolutely swimming in guns. There's three guns for every for every citizen of this country. And uh, there's a sort of quasi-made-up debate, a fascist debate in this country about assault weapons, the weapons that fire multiple, multiple dozens or hundreds of rounds in minutes or seconds. There is no reason whatsoever for a citizen to have such a gun. It is a weapon of war. The only thing you can do with it is kill people. You can't hunt game with it. You'd ruin the game. You, you couldn't use the game in any way. You can't use it in any way except to kill humans. But the gun lobby is so strong here, they own several senators, many, many uh, representatives, so that they're never going to get that changed. But in an ideal world, I mean, I would look at those weapons and say what my beloved Beto O'Rourke said that cost him the, the senator's seat in Texas, which is, of course, of course those things would be banned. Of course they would be. Automatic weapons? Assault, we assault weapons, weapons of war? Of course, it, citizens shouldn't have such weapons. Of course they shouldn't. That has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. I myself think that the writing, the wording of the Second Amendment is, is plain on its face. I consider it to be black letter law. If you're part of a state militia, you get to keep a gun. If you're not part of a state militia, you don't, regardless of what kind of a gun it is. But 
There's no, there's no, I'm not going to get anywhere with that, even though I think it plainly says that in the text. But that, that doesn't touch on whether or not you can have an assault rifle. You, you certainly cannot have an assault rifle. And people go on and on about how this is a diseased country and everybody has guns. But I think, as I've said on this channel many times before, I think if localities instituted a buyback program and just issued a long list of the kinds of weapons that they are willing to buy back, I think I think you'd have lines around the block. If if you were willing to do a buyback program for AR-15s, you'd get 90% of the AR-15s in America off the market in a week. I think it would be money, money well spent considering the cost of... Well, anyway. anyway uh, I, in other words, have a very, very distant relationship with guns. I've never been shot. I've never been shot. I've only pulled the trigger on a gun once, and I don't, I don't own a gun. I, I would never allow anyone I live with to own a gun. Uh, I, I don't fancy them in any way. I don't, I don't fancy their manufacturer or the, the artistry of shaping the metal or whatever, or any of the other things that gun aficionados do like. So if you are one, feel free to sound off. I'd love to hear about that world. Uh, and then uh, prop number nine is it ain't the bullet that gets you, it's the fall. And uh, the question is, how would, would be what would be your ideal way of cashing in your chips? Uh, and for a long time in my life, I would have given the stereotypical guy response of dying in battle, dying in combat. Uh, but the closer I get to 28, the less that is true. I think my answer now would be to die without any warning, without any debility, with a clear mind in my sleep at night. Maybe the way that I would amend that is that I did have warning so that I could prepare things, right? I have a little, I have a little life that's entirely dependent on me. <laughs> oh, very tired. That little life is very tired. She's entirely dependent on me. I have a structure around me, friends and caretakers and whatnot, who would take care of her. But it'd be nicer if I could prepare for it. It's something along those lines would be something quiet, something that doesn't involve combat of any kind or anything like that. But maybe one of you thinks that way. Uh, you know, dive bombing into a crowd of orcs, <laughs> yelling, Ellen, do you? <laughs> something like that. If you do, I'd love to hear it. Uh, and that's it. Those are all the questions for a very, very, very noisy tag. The neighborhood was quiet as a mouse all morning long until I started recording, and then it has been apocalyptically noisy. I'll be amazed if you can hear any of this. But maybe, maybe the, uh, the microphone here is doing me the favor of mostly picking up immediate proximal sounds and only distantly the background sound that would be great <laughs> be absolutely great doesn't sound to me from where i'm sitting like you can hear a word i'm saying but maybe maybe not uh but the only thing left in this tag is to tag some owl hoots <laughs> and of course for the purposes of this original tag i tag all my co-hosts on june on the range if they feel like doing it i would love to hear these answers i am just nosy enough to want to hear these answers if you were here over wine and calzones these are the kinds of questions i would ask you so feel free to indulge me. But that is the Rootin' Tootin' June on the Range tag for June on the Range 2023. Uh, and, you, of course, you don't have to be my co-host on this event to do this tag. I would love to hear these answers from all of you. So feel free. <laughs> and I'll see you soon, BookTube.